Um, I've, I've been given one of these titles uh, with a question mark, um, but really there's only one answer to this question, and everyone knows the answer to this question already before we start, so hardly going to bother to answer it. Um, but the question is, is this the end of globalization? And uh, the answer is, uh, I would say, no. Uh, and there's not really any doubt about that. Um, I think what we need to do today, or in this session instead, is to try to understand uh, why there is an end to globalization and what this means. That's more the interesting part of the discussion. Um, and also maybe we should start by trying to define our terms. Uh, and in this, uh, I will be using the term globalization. Um, I think that's the reason why it was put on the agenda, is to denote a very specific thing. Uh, not internet, uh, not uh, travel uh, to Costa Rica to go on holiday, uh, or anything of that sort, uh, or you know, go studying in uh, the US uh, or uh, something like that. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about, although it's related in a way, uh, but what we're talking about specifically here is when we talk about globalization, we mean free trade, the expansion of world trade, the expansion of the world market. Those are specific things to talk about. When we talk about the end of globalization, we talk about the end of this period of the expansion of world trade and the world market, and free trade specifically. Um, and the opposite of globalization, therefore, is protectionism. Um, and its various forms. There are many different forms that come in, but the general thrust of it is to try to put up barriers to, uh, to entry of, inter of the internet on the world market, but barriers to the world market to protect your own national market, your own national companies and so on, to try to defend them from competition abroad. And as Marxists, we have to understand this process uh, not as isolated policies, as in do we now an, a, a, a introduce a tariff, do we not introduce a tariff, do we give some subsidies to our industry, do we not give some subsidies to industries, these are individual policies, but that's not how we have to understand this thing. It's not a question of choice between one thing or another that the, uh, that the government faces. It's, uh, we have to understand it as a process. Right? We have to understand free trade and protectionism as part of a process of the development of capitalism, or the lack of development of capitalism, uh, more specifically. Uh, in a sense, it's uh, similar to the discussion that happened between uh, Kautsky, who you actually know who is, and Lenin, who you probably do know who he is, on the question of imperialism. What well, Kautsky talked about imperialism as a policy of the ruling class, whereas Lenin refused to talk about those terms. That's wrong to understand uh, uh, imperialism as a policy. Imperialism is part of a process. It's part of the, we call it the highest stage of capitalism. And in a similar way, we have to understand uh, free trade, opening up free trade, and all its opposite, protectionism, as part of a process of capitalist development. It's actually very closely linked as well to the development of imperialism. Um, I remember back in the early 2000s, and the chair has already alluded to this, globalization and free trade was all the rage. Uh, all the liberals and conservatives, uh, young people, we were very enthusiastic about all the wealth and prosperity that a globalization of free trade that we're going to bring to the world. Uh, they studied Adam Smith, the wealth of nations, and like it was the Bible, and uh, they thought it was the most profound thing ever written. And of course, they had a point. Like Adam Smith's wealth of nations is a very important work of economic theory, and it actually describes one particular aspect of the world and the development of capitalism very well. It was then expanded upon, his theories were expanded upon by a person called David Ricardo, another British economist, and both of them actually start laid on the foundation of Marxist economics, or in those two writers. So Marx didn't really have no objections to what they were saying. Uh, both of them were part of developing the labor theory of value that Marx uh, finalized in his writings. Um, world trade has this thing, it has transformed the world to a better place. It was part of the development of capitalism, or in Marxist terms, part of the development of the productive forces, part of the development of machinery, new technology, and its application in production 
that enable us to produce things in a much more efficient way, much less labor involved in each little product that we produce. For example, a very good example is back in the 1940s, a pen, like we're talking about pen, not pencils. These used to be a luxury item that were only afforded by a very, very few people, very expensive items. Um, whereas today, you can get one of these for, uh, I don't know how many you would get for a pound, but quite a few of them for a pound, right? They're not luxury. And that is because of the development of productive forces. And as part of that, one of the necessary components of this massive development of productive forces was the development of world trade. On a very banal level, how could we possibly produce mobile phones uh, or lithium batteries, which are in mobile phones or laptops or the, the new electric cars? How can we do that without the uh, cobalt and the nickel that is produced in other parts of the world? You cannot dig this out of the ground in Britain, you have to get it from other parts of the world. But more importantly is that you concentrate production concentrate production in specific countries and specific factories around the world, and this massively improves efficiency, right? If you have, if you have to produce things in 2,000 factories around the world, each one will be relatively small and not be able to produce things very efficiently. You have to have small machines and so on. Big factories tend to make much, uh, have can now house bigger machines and therefore produce things much more efficiently with much less labor time, much less uh, effort being put in, therefore uh, time being put in uh, by each worker. And that's the whole point. The cheapening of raw materials is also done by producing in those countries where it's easier to get hold of them. So, for example, it doesn't make so much sense to dig oil out of uh, from shale uh, oil production in the United States, which costs $60 a barrel to produce, when you can dig it out of the ground in Saudi Arabia for $5 per barrel, right? In, in a sort of completely free, uh, in the situation of completely free trade, you wouldn't be doing that. Now, obviously, there are other elements that come into the equation, which is why you have shale oil in the United States, but nonetheless, you can see the difference there. The point is that in certain parts of the world, you can dig these raw materials out of the ground a lot more easily than in other parts. So that's part of it. Um, and Adam Smith explained that uh, in his writing. Also then was elaborated by David Cardi, who adjusted some of these theories. Um, so those are the two sides, the cheapness of certain parts of the world in extracting raw materials, and the other part is the economies of scale. You can also have things like access to transport networks. So right now, electronics is very good to produce in, in uh, around the South China Sea because all the other parts of the supply chain are located there. So if you want to produce, for example, LED screens, uh, the screens for laptops and mobile phones and so on, it makes sense to produce it in that part of the world because you don't have to ship all the components they need for the screen all across the world in order to uh, uh, we have a fabric production. And why it makes very little sense, which Trump tried to do, to build a factory for production of screens in Michigan, because it's nowhere near where the other components are being produced. But they might still do it uh, because of production. So world trade massively cheapens commodities, that's the point, uh, and it frees up labor for other things, right? To produce even more commodities of different types, uh, or to, for example, put into the service sector, uh, healthcare and the like, which have massively expanded as a part of the economy, particularly in the West, right? So you look at the number of workers employed in industry in uh, the West, uh, uh, they are far fewer as a proportion of the population, but they're producing far, far more than they did 50 years ago, and more service sector like healthcare, uh, social care, and so on, is taking up a bigger share. The workforce, and that's quite, we actually would like it that way, I think. We would like to spend more money on for making sure that rather than us uh, or taking care of each other, we couldn't, I, I'm not very fond of the idea of putting a machine to take care of our elderly or a robot or prepare to be done by humans, whereas I don't have a problem with a robot producing my mobile phone, if you understand what I'm getting at. Now, the whole uh, period after the World War II, saw a massive expansion of world trade. 
Um, starting in the 1950s and the 1960s, but even more so after that, actually. Uh, in 1970, the ratio of world trade to GDP, so you take the, the amount of world trade or the value of world trade, and you compare it to the size of the world economy. So the world trade was 13% of GDP, so approximately one eighth of all production was meant for export. Um, and uh, by 1980, this had uh, reached 21%. Then in the 1990s, there was another burst of growth and it hit 24% by 2000. No, sorry. Uh, at the end of the 1990s, it had reached 24%. And it, before the crisis of 2008, it had reached 31%. So almost one in every three goods or services were produced for the world market. I suspect the proportion of goods produced for the world market is higher and services a bit smaller, but regardless. You can see the development there of the world trade, right? So the world trade plus much, much bigger proportion of total economy in the world, and that is precisely the phenomenon which we describe as globalization. Alongside this kind of economic development, which obviously helped facilitate this economic development, came the political or diplomatic development, which was the various agreements around free trade. So we have the general agreements on a general agreement on tariffs and trade, or GATT, which was signed in 1947 by <coughs> well, it, by 1949, 20 countries were involved in general agreement on tariffs and trade. Um, and this was followed by a number of other agreements to reduce tariff barriers, uh, uh, particularly then we're talking about the West, so between uh, Britain and France and the United States, um, and so on, other European countries. Um, this was, there were multiple more agreements in the 1950s and 1960s. The membership, the number of countries involved in the, in the GATT agreement or agreements, so it went from 20 in 1949 to 37 in 1959 to 75 in by 1968. And but, but by the time when GATT uh, was uh, absorbed into the new World Trade Organization, that's 1994, it's 128 countries. And uh, that's not half of the world, but uh, that's that's. That is half of the world's countries, but I suspect, I don't have the population statistics, but I suspect that it's a far bigger share of the world population uh, than, than the world economy, than is particularly, um, that was then covered by this general agreement of tariffs and trade. They also then, in 1994, replaced, or rather, they put, they added a number of agreements to the GATT agreement, uh, for example, they added one on services, one on government procurement or government purchases, and formed the WTO. That was also included this new resolution mechanism, which you might have heard about, where countries or companies can take other countries to court for their particular measures and so on. It never worked particularly well, but we produced a document. I wasn't around at the time, but uh, nonetheless, I found a document in our archives or on our website. Um, explained this process. The fact that we have entered an entirely new situation on a world scale is shown by the changed role of world trade. The massive development of world trade in the period 1948 to 1973 was one of the main reasons for the post-war upswing in world capitalism. <laughs> this enabled capitalism, partially and for a temporary period, to overcome the main barriers to the development of the productive forces that is, the nation state and private property. Now, this introduces an interesting question here. What role does the nation state play in all of this? So I'm going to delve into this question a little bit. Um, now, when capitalism first emerges out of feudalism, uh, it emerges as a national market. So capital, one of the, uh, the tasks of the bourgeois revolution is the creation of the national market. Before that, you have lots of local regional markets, uh, which are controlled often by feudal lords and so on. There could even be tariffs, which was the case in Germany, famously. There were tariffs between different parts of Germany. So you travel from one town to the next, and you will have to pay a tariff just to travel between those two things. So obviously, the first task 
that capitalism set or the bourgeois set themselves to abolish all these barriers within one nation. So to create a national market, that was the task they set themselves. And this overcall uh, came then the regional feudal limitations uh, to the development of the productive forces. So you could develop the productive forces then within a the national framework. But what this means also is that we can eventually get a national price for a product, i.e. a product costs a certain amount of thing to buy because there's a national market, so it has to har harmonize the prices in different parts of the country, and you get this kind of free-flowing trade between these different parts where you buy parts from different parts of the country in order, uh, and they're all the different producers in different parts of the country compete against each other. This is the national market. But as capitalism develops the productive forces, the machinery, the factories grow bigger and so on, uh, competition gives way to monopoly. So you have, from having a large number of smaller producers, they increase to go bigger and bigger by eating up the competition or defeating them, uh, turning, making them bankrupt, uh, and the, the companies go bigger and bigger. And this goes hand in hand with the development of the productive force, of the machinery, right? So bigger and bigger machinery costs more and more money, therefore makes it harder and harder for smaller, less capitalized companies uh, to uh, compete, and also for new entrants. So if you want to start uh, a, a new company in the mid-19th century or, uh, to produce uh, textiles, you do not, it's not enough anymore to buy some hand looms, you know, looms, use your hand, I don't know exactly know what they look like, but you know what I mean. Um, but you now have to buy, not, you have to buy a power loop, like a big machine, and a steam engine as well to drive and run the machine. So this obviously means that the barrier for an entry is much bigger. So you, this is basically a monopoly that has been created. Here you have the beginnings of international trade on a capitalist basis. Uh, but it's not just the uh, export of your products, your uh, commodities, which is the first stage of things, but then eventually also the export of the machinery, the ex investments brought. And that's one of the key developments that takes place later on in the 19th century. Not only rather than uh, exporting your commodities to another country, you start investing in a factory in that other country and producing the things there because it's cheaper than to produce in the country where it started off from. So you have the, or um, maybe more to the point, you lend money. So you put, lend, give the money to the bank, and the bank in turn will lend money to some company abroad to set up a factory somewhere. Uh, and this is part of the, you have the process of uh, fi development of finance capital. So all the big profits that are made by the monopolies in Britain wound up in the British banks. The British banks then start lending the money to Russia or other countries in order for them to build factories to make profits in these countries and then pay back in interest some of the profits that have been made in Russia or wherever it is. So then have, you can see here the start of the world markets with commodities and then eventually wound up being capital or money uh, that is uh, expanding and being you know, spreading across borders. Uh, and this stage, when you start having the export of capital, this is what Lenin then described as the higher stage of capitalism or imperialism. Um, and obviously, we haven't left that stage, we're still living in that stage of capitalism today. So, in order for the productive forces to develop in each nation, they need to be uh, then expand beyond the narrow limits of the national market. So at one point they have to expand beyond the limits of the regional market, now need to expand beyond the limits of the national market. And this has important consequences. Um, I'm returning again to this document from the 90s. The intensification of the international division of labor, the lowering of tariff barriers and the growth of trade, particularly between the advanced com capitalist countries, act as an enormous stimulus for the economies of the national states. This will in complete contrast to the dismemberment of the world economy in the period between the wars, when protectionism and competitive devaluations helped to turn the slump into the world this de depression. So, the upswing of the post-war period was both the cause and the effect of the development of the world trade. We have to remember with dialectics, right? You, often the cause is an effect and the effect is a cause. 
you have the uh, uh, upward spiral, that we call it, with the optimistic language, upgoing spiral. And so, so that is the question of free trade, or all the advantages of free trade, and the, the, why the free trade exists, why the world market is created. Then you have the opposite side, protectionism. And what is um, the logic of protectionism? Um, by the mid-19th century, British industries reigned supreme on the world market. Uh, using cheap commodities, British industries uh, conquered the world. They knocked out the entire textile industry in India, with big consequences, but also in all other parts of the world. The cheap commodities that British industries were produced uh, basically uh, uh, changed the face of the earth. And this was the era of the British free trade. And this was reflected then in the domination in the British Parliament but of the Whigs, the Whig Party, or the, you could call them liberals, but, we, we, we call, but it's more accurate to call them Whigs, but that was the name. And the repeal, famously, which we study British history, the repeal of the Corn Laws, which was agricultural tariffs, which uh, protected British agriculture. But these were repealed uh, in this period. And this enabled the bosses to keep the wages of the British industry low because cheap bread, cheap, cheap grain is cheap bread. Um, and also that benefited them by then being able to export uh, all their manufactured goods all over the world. But this posed a problem for other nations whose industries were not as efficient or as well developed. And they needed some means of protecting their industries from these cheap British commodities. As Engels put it in 1881, uh, these other countries did not see the beauty of a system by which the monetary industrial advantages possessed by England should be turned into means to secure to her <coughs> the monopoly of manufacturers all the world over and forever. So I, it's a bit convoluted language, but basically the point being, the other countries didn't see the beauty of uh, the Britain just being able, by virtue of you know, the wonders of free trade, Adam Smith and so on, destroy all the industries in Germany, in Sweden and so on, and then reign supreme forever and ever. So they took measures to stop this. And in Sweden, for example, they introduced a system of export restrictions. So a bit cold, you know, I think, why are you restricting your exports? But the point is this. Uh, the British industry is sucking in raw material, iron ore, uh, wood, and so on. And, um, but supplying Britain with increasing uh, amounts of unprocessed uh, raw materials would not help develop the Swedish industry, which is obviously the key to economic development. So they put, barrier, they put restrictions on how much unprocessed raw materials were was allowed to export. They even banned a number of uh, uh, raw materials to be exported to force the develop the processing of these like the steel making of the steel the making of the uh, paper the making of the boards and so on force that processing to take place in sweden and therefore they could then develop the swedish industry and when swedish industry caught up by the mid mid to late 19th century they then uh, lowered these restrictions and they were able to compete on par with the British industry. Similarly, they caught, caught in the US Civil War, the South, uh, in the, or the South, Southern State, the Confederacy, they were advocates of free trade because they wanted to export cotton without restrictions to, to the um, cotton mills in Lancashire in England, um, whereas the North, were the industrial heart of the uh, United States was, they wanted to have uh, protective barriers to protect themselves against these very same uh, British uh, industries. <coughs> so uh, this was part of the whole struggle in the Civil War, obviously. Well, the whole key question in the Civil War was the cotton trade, and leading to that the question of slavery. By the end of the 19th century, or rather the slavery leading to the cotton trade, but the cart before the horse. By the end of the 19th century, British industries were no longer dominant, and this changed. They were facing increasingly stiff competition abroad, particularly from Germany and the United States. And now this changed politics in Britain, and you have the turn 
to the Tory party, the Conservatives as they're called today, um, the Tory party who was then the advocates of protectionism, and they gained back power in the British Parliament towards the end of the 19th century. And in the British Empire, this played out in what was known as the imperial preference, whereby you would give preferential access to goods or commodities that came from other parts of the British Empire. This was introduced in Australia, in Canada, and a number of other British colonies in this period. Effectively, thus barring the United States, and or at least restricting the, uh, the access to these Financial markets, which remember the British Empire was by far the biggest, restricting the access for German and uh, US industries to these markets. So, this was an important part then in why German industries, who had emerged uh, and have found the limits of the national market, German industries who now needed to export abroad, they needed to find markets for their goods abroad, but they had no colonies. And this comes then the idea which was formed in the German ruling class of the need to redivide the colonies in the world uh, between the different powers and Germany, of course, getting a bigger share so that they would get a share of the, uh, of the markets. Um, yes, and this is, all, so this is also the period that we're talking about is when Lenin describes as imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism and when the world was divided between the imperialist nations. So actually, in the mid-19th century, there were less colonies than in 1820. So the number of colonies in the world was actually declining all the way until about 1860, 1870, when then suddenly there's a massive increase and the, uh, the British and the French in particular, but also Germany, a little bit later on, they start dividing up the whole world between themselves, in particular Africa. Um, and this also coincided then with the first tremors of the crisis that came where to come in the 1920s and 30s. Well, yeah, 30s in particular. But the first tremors of that crisis came in the early 20th century. And you start ha having the limits of uh, capitalism, and the limits of the whole expansion of capitalism was starting to be seen in this period and this then uh, was the, found, the background to World War I. So the question of global economic crisis, uh, uh, imperialism and free trade and protectionism, those things are all very closely inter interrelated. And we should remember that war is only politics by other means as Clausewitz said, and Trotsky added, well, or separately said, that politics is only concentrated economics. So I, you have the uh, ec economics of the development of productive forces, development of industry, monopolization, the exhaustion of the world market, uh, sorry, national market, exhaustion of the world market, all of this has uh, political consequences uh, and eventually also military consequences. Um, the First World War, uh, or after the First World War, the First World War solved none of these problems, in fact, just exacerbated them. And uh, after this, they then developed like a real period of same protectionism. And Adam Smith called protectionism, called it beggar, <laughs> beggaring all their neighbors, he called it, which then has been translated in modern times to beggar their neighbor, uh, which means to turn your neighbors into beggars. Right. So the neighboring countries, uh, so neighbor countries' workers into beggars. That's what I mean. Um, and he was uh, describing with this phrase. He was describing the attempt to turn uh, to cure recession unemployment within your own country uh, by exporting it to other countries. And the way to do this is to shift uh, consumption from goods imported from abroad to goods that are imported uh, or produced domestically. Um, of course, in conditions of recession or even more depression, these contradictions are massively exacerbated. So you have the problem of unemployment is exacerbated, the exhaustion of the world market, domestic market, all these problems are massively exacerbated in a period of economic crisis. 
So in the middle of the Great Depression, the British introduced what they call imperial preference, also in Britain, which meant that the British market was then uh, res found, had restrictions from all over the rest of the world, with preference then for colonies. Um, the 1933, President Hoover introduced an act called the Buy American Act, which forced government contractors to preference, um, and obviously government being probably the biggest uh, consumer in any country, forced government contractors to preference domestically produced goods. Quite a complicated thing, but uh, that's, uh, that's what this act did. And there are many other countries that enacted similar policies uh, in this period of time. Um, so this is the kind of similar scenario that we're facing today. 2007 and 2008 really put an end to the process of expansion of free trade. They had something called the uh, Doha round of trade negotiations that were meant to, uh, in, under, under the umbrella of the WTO. And these trade negotiations were meant to uh, remove agricultural tariffs or agricultural subsidies, uh, particularly in the US and Europe. And this was meant then to also then the, what we call the developing world or the uh, underdeveloped countries or whatever you want to call them. Uh, former colonies, they were meant to then reduce some of their tariffs in response. So that, was, that was the aim of this, what they called the Uruguay round. But this, uh, uh, by 2007, 2008, this basically died. There's no serious attempt to revive it ever since. So this process of uh, ever decreasing tariffs and so on was brought to an end with the crisis of 2008, 2000, uh, yeah. Um, and at the same time, Obama, who was the president at that time, uh, launched uh, the slogan, Buy American. Uh, some of you might remember that. He also, this Buy American Act of, of Hoover in 1933, actually remained on the statute books of the US all through this period. But it was undermined by various kind of um, agreements they made. So these agreements were then the, under the guise of WTO or GATS. They all kind of um, undermine this act and reduce its effectiveness, and there are all kinds of limitations, planes of power. But in his, uh, in Obama's presidency, they basically beefed it up. So in his 2009 Recovery Act, so this was the depth of the recession just after 2008, he uh, then we beefed up this act again to give it more powers to basically force the government contractors again to uh, buy more American. Goods. Uh, and he tried to do it even more in uh, his what he called the Jobs Act of 2011, but the Republicans stopped him. So it's a bit of change uh, the guards there, but uh, he, he basically had plans to even further introduce more protectionist measures, but it was blocked. Trump, of course, as you know, was a big fan of protectionism, um, but he even the measures that he took were restrained by the rules of the WTO, which he more or less, well, at least to some extent followed. Um, but now, obviously, you have Biden coming in, and Biden is not is, has always revoked some of Trump's most extreme uh, or sort of most we say hair raising method, measures, the ones that affected Canada, and Europe. Who, obviously, Biden's policy is to try to be friends with Canada and Europe. Uh, unlike his predecessor, but uh, his general approach is that not that of free trade, but he wants to modernize the rules of the WTO. Now, modernizing the rules of the WTO, it's not lost on anyone what that means. That means weaken. So I basically give, give national states more power to introduce protectionist measures. That's what he would like to do. Although, as the, the business press were, although they were generally depressed about this proposal is, they said, well, at least he's in favor of rules-based international trade, even if he wants to weaken the rules. So there are the sort of um, expectations of politicians in this period is not that they would increase free trade, but rather that they would uh, not uh, introduce so many protectionist measures. That's the level of ambition. And behind this is two pressures. On the one hand, the crisis is threatening to ruin industries and jobs in the United States and in Europe and so on, which is why they then tried to take measures 
to protect their own industry. It's also happening in China, uh, where the government at various points have introduced measures that effectively dumped some of their surplus capacity onto the world market. Um, um, so they're all involved in this, basically, because uh, the, the market is no longer expanding in the way that it was back in 2006. Um, and the other, so there's the economic crisis on the one hand. On the other hand, this last 30 years of economic development has produced a new world power. So the China has had, in the last 30 years, since the mid-1990s, yeah, that's the last 30 years, isn't it? Has had 7 to 10 percent annual growth in labor productivity. So every year, a Chinese worker has become 7 to 10 percent more efficient. And there's no other place on the planet, practically, where this similar kind of development has taken place. In fact, in Britain, the productivity of the workers have been falling, not rising, um, over the last period. Um, and this means that the amount of uh, value that a Chinese worker produces has gone from $3.8 to $13.8 per hour. If you understand what that means. Still far below that of the West, but nonetheless, it's a massive increase. And this is the average as well. In some industries, this will be far higher. Falling labor costs through spending on capital means that China has now become one of the world's biggest industrial nations. But as I said, China still lags behind, and the IMF estimates that the average labor productivity in industry in China is 35% of that the global best practice. Now, I don't exactly know what global best practice means uh, in practical terms, but yeah, if they have like an imaginary most productive scenario with present technologies and so on, uh, and China is at 35%. Now, I guess no one is at 100%, but Western countries would be uh, at a higher point, for sure. Only in the most advanced areas, like cities around the Pearl River estuary, Shanghai or Beijing, you would get a GDP that is similar to that of Spain or Portugal. So that's the kind of, on average, the level of Chinese industry or technology is that. It's, it's lower, basically, than the West. However, China is a much bigger country in terms of population than the US uh, or Europe. Well, yeah, also Europe, yeah. Um, twice the size of population in Europe. But um, so, although each, on average, the, the productivity is lower, still the mass of uh, wealth created means that China is now approaching, not quite there yet, but approaching the economy is the same, almost the same size as the US economy. So basically, and this obviously means something to world relations, right? It means something for world relations, to the balance of world trade and so on. And this is not lost on the Europeans and the Americans, who basically are trying now to restrict further development of China. So that's a kind of attempt, basically, to hold China's development back. And what particularly provoked them, uh, provoked, maybe the wrong word, but what particularly got them worried was the, le the plan of, I forgot what it's called, it's the, uh, it is the industrial plan, it's called China 2023, 2025, what was it? Or something like that. Uh, it's like the industrial plan, basically, which included China developing a world class semiconductor industry, aerospace industry, and I the third one, I've forgotten. Uh, anyway, the three key kind of growth fields in the world economy, key important industries without implications for all kinds of other things, including military purposes, of course. So, and this was a big warning sign then to the um, Americans and the Europeans who started thinking, well, actually, China might not just be this sort of uh, country we can treat paternalistically, and invest and get some profits from, but actually this would become a serious contender. Oh, 3G is the third, um, right, sorry to run out of time here. I'm turning into Fred Weston here. <laughs> Fred always runs over. It's a law of nature. Um, now, The US remains, however, of course, the superpower. Its military expenditure is more than, more than 
twice that of China. It's also more than all. So if you have US are spending most on this military, they're spending more on their military than the next 10 countries combined, right? So the US remains supreme on a world scale. We shouldn't forget that. But it comes to quite a country, consider a country like Taiwan, obviously this question of the balance of power between the US and China has some rather important implications. Because Taiwan is the country for producing semiconductors, which are the component for every electronic device we have now. It's the only country almost, 92% of the smallest semiconductors, of 4 <coughs> nanometers or less, are produced in Taiwan. So if, for example, the US were to embargo, or the US were to embargo China, block China's access to these semiconductors, that would have tremendous imp implications for Chinese industries and the military as well. Just like the US had just done with, and the US and Europe have just done that to Russia. So US and Russia now, uh, US and Europe now sanctions any company that will sell semiconductors to Russia. And the Chinese government are looking at this and they're thinking, well, look, if they can do this to Russia, they can do it to us. Now, what does that mean for Taiwan? It means that it sharpens the struggle over this island, which is producing these semiconductors. Uh, who will be the ones that be able to control economically or politically this island? Because this is where you get your semiconductors from, which is the key to everything. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, this is what this, the context of uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan was. It's also why the Chinese responded so strongly. Uh, there was a political element to that, you know, the need to sort of shore up your own uh, support and so on. But it's economically of crucial importance at this moment in time. And speaking of barriers to entry, the Chinese uh, the Taiwanese Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, which is this company that produces 92% of the smallest, their expansion plans over the next five, 10 years includes $100 billion worth of investment. So you can imagine the level of investment that is needed to maintain these kind of industries. Obviously, both China now and the United States and Europe they're all struggling now to build up their own semiconductor industries, their own chips manufacturing industries, in order not to be so reliant on Taiwan. Now, this is the end of globalization. Because you can no longer rely uh, on the uh, world trade, the world market, for the supplies of your own industries. For example, if China were to blockade Taiwan, which militarily, which it could very well do, it's got to capability to do that. It's not far from the Chinese coast. Um, if it were to do that, block the entire uh, European and US industries from accessing the, the semiconductors, then the consequences would be tremendous for uh, the economies of Europe and the United States. Now, it might never do that, but the threat might be sufficient, right? So these, uh, these, this that mean that not just for, so these countries don't feel like, well, look, we've got to do something. China need to feel like, well, we've got to do something. Russia feels we've got to do something. So all of them need to produce or they build their own national industries. So you're destroying, basically, you're rolling back on the world market. You can no longer rely on the world market. Every single company will be thinking the same thing. Intel will be thinking, well, look, we need to re- we, uh, they had, used to have their own chip plants. They're thinking, right, we need to um, uh, build a, build, rebuild our, uh, let's say, our uh, chip making uh, productive capacity. And I think they've been given some sort of $10 billion or something from the American state in order to start this process. Uh, I think uh, the CEO of Intel spoke publicly about this and he said, we should produce the entire supply chain should be inside the borders of the United States. Uh, that's what he said. Uh, I think it's utopia, they're never going to achieve it, but uh, you get the gist of where they're trying to go. And all this will have consequences for the cost. Precisely what Adam Smith and Ricardo and others, economists are saying, also, you know, the neoliberal economists, as they call it, they all said, look, all that is happening if you introduce protectionist measures, it's going to make everything more expensive. Right? You're going to reduce the efficiency in the world economy. 
it's going to basically sink you. It's going to uh, lead to a depression or uh, a collapse in the economy. And they all know this. It's not uh, rocket science. Uh, they all read the textbooks, at least most of them. I'm not sure about this trust, but um, uh, or Donald Trump either. But you know, they know this is taking place, but yet they cannot stop this process from taking place. That's also why we shouldn't conceive of free trade or protectionism as a policy, but it's part of a general process. And at the heart of this um, uh, crisis that's taking place in world relations and world trade lies the crisis of capitalism that started in 2008. What position, so, and the consequences will be, obviously the other thing they're facing right now is the problem of inflation. And inflation, what's going to be the consequence of all this for inflation? Well, if everything, if all these key components in our products become more expensive, commodities become more expensive, uh, the consequence is going to have more and more inflation, more cost of living crisis, more strikes in order to try to catch up, workers trying to catch up, uh, keep their wages in line with inflation, and so on. It's going to increase the instability on the world scale. What position do we take? Uh, so, of course, historically, the market, the invisible hand, the free, you know, the world market, the invisible hand, and so on, they played a progressive role. They developed the productive forces and so on. But it's not a question, we can't just turn back the clock, right? Arbitrarily, like the liberals would like us to. Just, right, let's just turn the clock back to 2006 or 1973 or 1968 or whatever. It's not how history works. You can't just turn the clock back because we would like to. Um, but we must understand this whole development of capitalism, post-war period, that whole period of expansion, of economic growth, and so on, that's come to an end. Really now, truly, finally. There was a bit of a hiccup in the 70s, now it's truly come to an end. And that means that all these things, all these sureties, all these uh, uh, stability which the ruling class could rely on for decades is gone, finished. And with that also, this, the expansion of free trade, globalization, and so on, and we have a return to protectionism uh, because of the instability that is in the system itself. And our role is to explain why this is taking place and the consequences it's going to have, and fundamentally, how, uh, well, on the one hand, free trade is actually the very reason why we're here in the first place. Free trade led to the crisis, right? Protectionism will deepen it. Uh, that's the truth of it. Even if they were to introduce magically some free trade policy, it would just lead to another crisis anyway. Uh, because free trade is not a solution to the problem. The problem is capitalism. And we are socialists, we're Marxists, we're revolutionaries. And we see in the collapse of globalization only another stage in the collapse of the capitalist system as a whole. And we see the great benefits of world trade, but that the, the the, tra the, uh, the increase of world trade on the base of capitalism is finished. It's, no, it's not going to be revived, uh, and that's, the end of, that's it. Only on the base of working class taking power can we re-establish world trade or, and world relations on a healthy basis. And this, of course, will then propel a leap, massive leap forward in development of production, development of human uh, of material wealth in society, and development of humanity as a whole. But it only, can only be on the basis of the working class taking power and uh, basically on the basis of the world socialist revolution. And that's what we're here for.